We're dropping her off and right in front of the place where her mom lives, there was a candle lighting for a young man. And you can see his face there where the candle lighting is. And and my heart immediately goes to a to a place of, of soberness. I go, man, I know this this can't be a young man that just lost his life. And on the picture, this she lives right in South Central, her mom does. And on the picture, it looks it looks as if this man is is the ni nicest young man that you've ever come across. And I asked Sydney, my heart again, I was very sober, and I asked Sydney, I go, sis, did this young man die? And she goes, bro, this, this young man was just shot in, in front of my house, in front of my mom's house, not too long ago. And my heart immediately became very sad because although this young man, and then I asked her, was he in a gang? And she, she said yes. And then I knew for sure what happened. It was an issue of the heart. This, this world's problem is an issue of the heart. And I immediately go, if people learn what it meant to love God with everything they had, there'd be no need for gang colors. There'd be no need for geographic areas or dying for a geographic area that you don't own. God owns it. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand the culture. Growing up in San Diego, I grew up in that culture. Amen. So I, I get it, and I believe Satan has a very strong strong foot and stronghold in that area yeah. over the hearts of men. But at the same time, I knew immediately what the issue was. And God just really confirmed what I needed to preach this morning. We'll start off here in Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll take a look here. At verse 6. The Bible reads, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. See, we're all in agreement this morning that we should have a world where everybody loves God with everything they have. Agreement? Right. <laughs> At the same time, before that happens, the Bible says that something else has to happen. And I love getting revelation in, in my quiet times. I love reading through the whole Bible in a year because you read the same book over and over and you never know how God's going to speak to you the second, third time you read a book. And so for me, you, you may go, well, I know all about the book of Deuteronomy. It's the book of the second law. The second time Moses has to reiterate the law that God instituted back in Exodus. Now, if you're the true Bible scholar, a true Bible student, you know that some things were reiterated for the second time, and then some things we come across and read for the first time. And so for us, this is the first time we see a scripture like this. God said to the Israelites that before you love me with everything, I have to circumcise your hearts. Yeah. <laughs> and to me, that I went, whoa! You know, you see something and it's like preaching yeah. material. Yeah. I guess not, amen. Come on, Come on, but, bro. but I went, whoa, this is this is what in the world is God talking about. You gotta circumcise my heart so I can love you with with everything I have. And then I and then I start to study. Amen. Now do you guys know what a circumcision is? Yeah. It's the cutting off of a foreskin, amen. <laughs> and that is how God consecrates the firstborn or, or those born in the nation of Israel to himself. And so in other words, God wants to set us apart for himself through the circumcision of our hearts. Right. And I go, whoa, this is awesome. And then my heart started to hurt a little bit. Right. <laughs> because isn't this the challenge of our life? Yes. Come on, bro. Letting God cut up all the yeah. unnecessary things from our heart yeah. that don't necessarily need to be there. And I went, here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple different hearts. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Because the world needs someone, a guy and a gal who can love them with everything they have, yeah. but he also needs a guy and a gal who will let him circumcise their hearts yeah. so they can love him right. with everything they have. I know we like to talk about love here at Southland. Love yeah. God, love people. Amen. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So we're going to talk about one of these requirements here. Let's look at our first heart. Turn over to Luke, chapter 8. Come on, Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Luke chapter 8, and the first heart we'll look at is the choked heart. The choked heart. Now, the choked heart cannot do anything except love what is choking them out. And then we'll see where the choked heart is. But the choked heart can't love anything else besides what is choking them out. Luke chapter 8. We'll read a parable here. This is the first time Jesus starts to speak in parables. And he tells his disciples, this isn't in Luke 8, but he accounts in Mark 4. John Mark accounts of Jesus in Mark 4. And he tells his disciples, if you don't understand this parable, you will not understand any other parable. In other words, this is the easiest parable to understand in the whole New Testament. All right. So praise God, I'm keeping it simple for you guys this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, and, and we'll read that the Bible describes certain hearts and how certain hearts respond to the word of God, which is the seed, amen? Yeah. And the heart is the soil. Luke 8, we'll take a look here at our first heart. Verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns. Oh, babe, you guys ever been there? <laughs> which grew up with it and showed the plant. So here we have a heart, our seed, that fell along thorns. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus goes into explanation of what this truly means here. And we'll see if you guys fit this description here. I just want to help. Okay. I don't want a heart that's choked up. Help me, girl. I want a heart that is used by God. Come on, bro. Yeah. And that's why we're here this morning, to be yeah, used yeah. by God. Come on, bro, it's good. Take a look at verse 14. Okay. Jesus goes into explanation. The seed, because the disciples didn't quite understand. Verse 14. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. See, here we have a heart that loves God at the same time is immature. Amen? Because this is a heart that actually grows up in the Lord. At the same time, the thorns, which are the worries of this life, riches and pleasures, they grow up alongside this heart, and they choke the heart out. Yeah. You guys with me here this morning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. come on, bro, that's good. The worries of this life. The worries of this life are just that. The worries of this life. A scripture that I, I really came across and I... And I just had to memorize it as a young Christian was 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. Ooh. For our light and momentary troubles are cheating for us. And a toward eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. Understanding that the, the worries of this life are just that. Ten for very and of this life. Ooh. See, if you're married this morning. Okay. I'm sure you have the worries of this life. <laughs> Maybe you have kids. Yeah. Is is your kid always an angel? No. 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 <laughs> now, now I'm preaching, right? Hey, come on, bro. <laughs> Does your kid always stay as clean as you want them to stay? No. Probably not, right? about those bills and those finances and, and, and all those things. I mean, the kids need shoes, baby needs diapers. I mean, you have to eat. Your wife has to eat. Oh, bro. I mean, there's a thing called rent in Southern California, right? I mean, or can we just live for free? Oh. Those days, those days are over, right? Over. Sometimes I, I just got to get open. I envy the people sleeping out here in the park. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Hey man, I could probably get away with a couple of nights. If you're single, I mean, you, you have a thing called yourself, right? Uh, yeah. Can't you be a thorn to yourself at times? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, ever done something, you ever done something stupid away? Man, I blew it. And then you can't, you can't be mad at anybody else. <laughs> and then you also have something called maybe work. You guys with me here? Yeah. You gotta punch in, you gotta punch out, and try not to punch your coworker. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're if you're a campus student, 
man, you go to school, hey, amen. Okay. And uh, it's, it's, I, I don't envy students either. Because going to school, getting a, getting a degree, I mean, boy, is it hard work? Yeah, yeah, it's hard work. Oh, my goodness. Let's give it up for the students right there. Right. out of all of us. <laughs> they don't have work. <laughs> they don't have kids. They don't have rent. Everything for the most part is provided for them. They have the decision to either play video games or love God. <laughs> but here's what I put before you this morning. If these things are the things that, that choke you up this morning, you have a false sense of prioritization when it comes to your life. Come on, bro. Now, how do I know this is an issue for us as a ministry? And if you're here visiting this morning, we just keep it real as, as family. So if you're compelled by, by something I say, if you're impacted, praise God. But how do I know this is an issue for us? This heart being choked out is the heart that is unfruitful. Come on. Come on. This is the heart that, that the scripture calls immature. That's the other word used in Mark 4, verse 19. You guys can write that scripture down. Come on, bro. See, what happens is your family, which is seemingly important, becomes the priority of your life. Talk about it. Your family was never meant to be the priority of your life. If you're single, I get you have to go to work and make a living, but that never meant to be the priority of your life. If you're a student, school was never meant to be the priority of your life. And if you're a teen, praise God, Xbox was never meant to be the priority of your life. He said, I don't have a system. Well, you playing with these guys more than enough. And what happens is, what happens, these things choke us out these seemingly good things. Come on, bro. Turn over to Mark chapter 4 with me. Come on, bro. Mark 4. And if that one didn't hit you here, we'll take a look at verse 18. I love Mark and how there's four different gospels because each gospel highlights something else that's important to us. In Luke 8, it says, not only does the words of this life choke us up, but it says riches and pleasures. In Mark 4, I love what it highlights. I think it's a little more skinny for us this morning. Verse 18, still others like seed, sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the words of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. See, here the Bible says, not only the words of this life, but the deceitfulness of wealth on, well. and the desire for all these other things can choke us out. Now, riches and pleasures, deceitfulness of wealth, all these other things, they both go hand in hand. But why? That was Mark 4, 18 and 19. But why do you think wealth is so deceitful? Just think about it for a second. I'll explain it. But why Why do you think the Bible uses this, this verbiage? See, wealth is, wealth is deceitful. <laughs> wealth is deceitful. It can give you a false security, but it gives you everything you want. True. Yeah. Even Ecclesiastes talks about that. Money is the answer to everything. But what you get, what you want, that's exactly all you acquire is what you want. Come on. Now here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. If you acquire what you want and it is not God, you will be choked out. Come on, bro. That's the whole point of this passage. Which is why the Bible says that the desire for all these other things will choke us out. So what's our challenge this morning? To desire nothing except God. Amen. That's, right. That's, right. That's, really, that's really where it starts. See, what happens is we wake up and we immediately are gravitated to the thing that gives us the most pleasure. 
For some of us, it could be our phones. Yeah. Getting on the Facebook, uh -oh. seeing what's going on. But doesn't it make you feel good when you see some, some gossip right there? Uh -oh. Are you seeing what's going on in someone else's life? Oh, don't forget about the ads they have now on Facebook. Uh -oh. yeah. They put the ads on there and, oh, they cater those ads to your shopping habits. Yeah. So have you ever scrolled through Facebook and went, man, that's everything I like? Well, yeah, yeah. they got you. Yeah. <laughs> that means they already have you. And then you click, you click, you click, you buy, you get what you want. And guess what? You're going to want something else. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because that thing rusts, it gets old, you break it, you got to buy another one. Or they come out with the new one, i.e. the Apple. Uh -oh. Every year. Uh -oh. The S8. The Galaxy, hey man, I'm an Apple guy. I don't want to lose any friends. <laughs> and what happens is, it all starts with wealth. So, some of us go, well, I, I need to work. Well, why do you need to work? You need to work for your needs or to buy what you want. Uh -huh. To please, to please your desires. And I take it what this world needs are for guys and gals to reprioritize, to simplify their lives, circumcise their hearts, so they are not choked out anymore. I think the teens are setting a great example in this area. Come on, teens! So the teens should baptize Johnny Jr. Now why? I think I, I think I may be on to something. Because they only have two decisions to make every day. For some of us, we have too many options. I'll get to that in a second. But for them, their life is real simple. Wake up and play video games or have my quiet time. Have my time with God anymore. Yeah. <laughs> the only one that works. His life, his life is a little more complicated. It's crazy. Boy, if I can go back to your guys' age, don't even start. I know, right? So, so at the same time, Real quick, at the same time, we know the fruit of their labor. We know where they have been putting their hearts. Why? Yeah. Because they just baptized. Yeah. Come on. Come on, bro. The byproduct of them not being choked out is fruit. Some of us put inviting people out to church and being in Bible studies on this pedestal that it was never meant to be on. Come on, bro. You stay close to God and people want to be near you. Your, your co-worker is going to see it. Yeah. And they go, well, why in the world are you so happy? <laughs> no one's happy working this job. Well, 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 let, well, well let me tell you what my heart is. Hey, man. Yeah. I was in staff the other day, our, our weekly meeting for everyone on, on paid staff in the church. And Blaze just got back from one of his missionary oh, journeys. Yes. Hey. Yeah. And what a great story of of our brothers and sisters in the third world. I'm in constant prayer for our brothers and sisters. You guys should be as well. But he told the story of everything the church is involved in. Thus, what they're truly worrying about as a fellowship. And I think this is our challenge here. we got to take the teen challenge and simplify our lives. But we also need to take the Haiti challenge. Okay. Because in America, we're a tad bit jaded here. They feel, they feel bad for us in the third world because they don't know how we can stay faithful as Christians. Because we have too many options. They go, how in the world if you can choose this and that and Facebook and Twitter and every other social media, you guys know, the teens know. If you have that many options, how how can you choose God? I couldn't make it. So they feel bad for us. Wow. Here's what they're worried about last Sunday. So Blaze counted the cost and studied the Bible and, and, and asked the whole Congregation, hey, do you guys want to be disciples? Are you guys ready to give your life to God for the rest of your life? And a ton of them say, I'm, I'm ready to give my life to God. I got to get baptized. But then the problem arises, what, where do we baptize them? And Blaze is thinking America, he, you know, it's been a while since he's been there. He goes, we'll get a ball pool. And we'll put 20, 30 gallons of water in this pool and we'll baptize them. The brothers in Haiti go, bro, Blaze, where are we going to get 20, 30 gallons of water and for the Prince Haiti. You see the worry? Yeah. You see what they're worried about? Yeah. So immediately they go, man, we gotta, we can't leave these guys. Say, hey, we gotta get them baptized. Come on. But there's nowhere to get water. So one of the preachers go, whoa, bro, I, I know of another church. How about we ask them if we can baptize there? So they ask another church if they can baptize. The church says, okay, yet 
Another problem, things aren't just a hot skip and a jump like that leg. So to baptize at the other church, two, three hours away from the place where they currently were. Now there is no 405, there's no 605, there's no 710, there's no all those things that we complain about on the freeway, there's none of that. There's a Jeep with no roof, no AC, and you have to drive to get to where you're going. Come on. And guess how hot it is in Haiti? You can only imagine. So they got to drive in this Jeep to the place where they thought they were going to baptize. Guess what happens? There's water, but the water pump to draw it out of the well is broken. It takes an hour, two hours. They thought the pump was going to work. The pump doesn't work. But yet they go, they're worried about getting this guy baptized. And they go, I got to what do we do? So they go, okay, bro, let's drive some more hours to the beach. They make it to the beach, and they baptize them, amen? Yeah. 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 The brothers and sisters in the third world, the only thing they were consumed with was baptizing. Was, was helping someone know God better Amen. and achieving the goal, which is salvation for those that didn't know him. After being choked out this morning, this is your challenge to be consumed with nothing else than helping others know God. Yeah. If you don't take the challenge, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for all these other things will choke you out before you know it. Come on, bro. We'll look at the second heart here, and that is the sick heart. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 13. Come on, bro. Come on, Come on bro. And I'm coming in here for a landing. Awesome. I know the attention span at the park is 50% shorter than what it normally is on any given Sunday. Proverbs 13, verse 12, the sick heart. The Bible reads, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a true of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. You guys should just have this scripture written on your heart. Have you guys ever had your hope deferred? Yes. You guys know that word deferred? Yes. It means delayed. Yes. Now I came up with a, a biblical conviction here from this scripture because the more I read my Bible, God doesn't disappoint. God doesn't delay. Hope doesn't disappoint if it's from God. So if your hope is deferred this morning, if your heart is sick, you don't have your hope in God. Come on, bro. That's kind of how this scripture reads here. And there's a lot of things we can put our hope in. Yeah. I think sharing personally, and we don't need a sick heart. A sick heart can't help anybody get well. A sick heart needs help. So what I discovered this past week was that I had my hope and thus my heart in the past. Come on, bro. I have my hope and my heart in the past. Now, I got a little quiet because we can all relate. Yeah, come on. I think for this region, a lot of people have come in and out of this region and they've done great things. Come on, bro. You guys with me here? Yeah. yeah. Come on, bro. You look back at your life and, and everything you've done here and you've done great things. And so for us, and really Chip pointed this out here at staff, for us there's a fear of letting go of the past because there's good things in the past. Come on, bro. Would you guys agree? Yeah. 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 Because all of us can look back at our life and go, oh my. Last year was awesome. Two years ago was awesome. I mean, man, if I could just go back to when I was 15, it would be awesome. That is such an unbiblical way to live, Christianity. Philippians 4, verse 13, I'm not going to have you turn there, but write the scripture down. Paul lived his life biblically by forgetting what was behind and straying towards what? What's ahead. What's ahead, the future. And if we put our hope in the past, what happens is we dwell on the past, and guess what else starts to creep up in our hearts? Bitterness. Right. Come on, bro. Come on. And you're bitter because you're not where you want to be. And you're looking in the past. Now, what would happen if we all decide to look to the future? If we all decide to do the biblical thing. Come on, bro. Now, we use the past as a platform, but the good, 
with the bad, we cut it off and put our hope in God today, Come on. this afternoon. Come on, bro. What would be the fruit of that? Again, I just had to dwell on this. And for me, I think for Joy and I, we've done a lot as far as ministry is concerned, but there's always that, that little bit of your heart that, that wants to see the true fruit of your labor. And so for us, we've moved so many times in three years, four years. We've probably moved about four or five times in the past three years as a newlywed couple. I can still consider us newlywed. Three years is nothing. Come on, bro. We're still learning and growing. But what happens if I continue to dwell on the past? You guys get my bitter heart. Come on. The people I study the Bible with, they can't pinpoint it, but there's just a weirdness of me not giving my heart to them because I'm thinking of the past. And if you want to affect anybody in a positive manner, Amen. cut it off. Come on, Come on bro. Come on. That's right. And you're part of the solution in the future if there is an issue. Amen? Amen. And some of us had a bad week. We just need to shake it off. Yeah. We're going to this morning. You're going to have a good week. Just shake it off. We love you. It'll be awesome. I want to talk to the singles for a second. Some singles put their hope in relationships. There you go. First Corinthians 7. Now you guys need to have this picture on your heart too. Come on. Because there comes a point in time where you're no, no longer content with being single. And you want to be in a relationship. Now is there anything wrong with that? No. Absolutely not. It is of God. But here's what I have an issue with. If you put your hope in wanting a relationship, before you know what it means to put your hope in God. Oh, come on, talk about it, bro. Come on, come on bro. <laughs> I'm not going to say it again for the second time. You guys know what I said. <laughs> First Corinthians 7. There's a whole chapter where the Bible describes two gifts. One gift is being single, and one gift is being married. Now, here's what singles forget. That being single is just as much of a gift as it is to be married. Yes. Yes. And a gift from God does not disappoint. A gift God knows how to encourage us. At the same time, putting our hope in, in God requires time. It's not God's timing, it's your timing. Learn what it means to love God with everything you have. Or else you'll love your spouse just as much as you love God. And that may be a very discouraging marriage. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And I only hit this because Satan really capitalizes on singles putting their hope in relationships more than God. Come on, Mom. And far be it from us this summer if we see any brother or sister lost to that mindset. Come on, bro. I'm not, I'm not, while I'm here, it's not going to happen. Come on. Amen? Come on, Come on. Thank you. How do we put our hope in God? What's the practical? You wake up in the morning and you grab your Bible. You get on, it's a very simple practical. Come on, bro. You wake up, hope starts in the morning. You don't touch your phone. Who's guilty of that? Yeah, come on. You don't touch your phone. I get radical. Some of us need to get radical. I would eat. Right, right. I mean, what, what, what do you want more? I mean, if Jesus comes back and I'm not eating, but I'm, I'm in my scripture, I got a better chance. Get in your scriptures. Yeah. I can look at some of us. I say the majority of us have never read the whole Bible before. If you have not read the whole Bible before, there's no way you can have your whole hope in God. You don't. Know, you haven't read through the. You haven't read Numbers and Leviticus, and you're scared of reading Revelation. That's the most one of the most encouraging books in the Bible. And you don't know what Hebrews talks about. And you don't know the Book of Romans. You don't know your church history in the Book of Acts. Well, no wonder you're struggling all the time. Isn't it we are a Bible church? Yeah. 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 Come on, bro. Come on.
Yeah, this is probably my third, fourth time reading through the whole Bible. Guess what? It never gets over. Closing out here, our third heart. Third heart. Deuteronomy 23. Verse 14. The impure heart. And I have read some things, and I can sit my nose to whoever wants it. But Deuteronomy 13, verse 14. Here's what I feared very early on as a young Christian. Some of us go, oh, he's talking about purity. Yes, I'm talking about purity. That's right. But here's why I address this issue. Because very early on as a, as a young believer, I'm still a young believer, as a younger believer, I made the decision that I would fear not being used by God. Here's where purity comes in. An impure heart is a heart that God cannot use. Plain and simple. And I'm talking about impurity of heart. Yeah. Which is more than what most of us are thinking. Deuteronomy 23. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, verse 14. Yeah. For the Lord your God moves about in your camp to protect you and to deliver your enemies to you. Doesn't that sound like a world that you want to live in? Yeah. Gotta fantasize about it because only if people obey, because you're talking about the scriptures, can a world like this be achievable. But there is a stipulation on our part. Your camp must be what? Holy. Holy. Your camp must be pure. So that he will not see among you anything in this. And turn away from you. See, God wants us to live the most pleasant away from Satan. That's all he had in mind if you go back to Genesis. Right. Again, this lifetime is, is the battle of getting back to that. But there is a place called the kingdom where God wants to protect us from Satan. From our enemies. At times, our enemy can be ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Watch out. I can totally attest to that. I am my worst enemy 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, Satan uses our simple nature so why give him the foothold? Now all God requires to have him protect us from our enemies and to dwell amongst our camp. Isn't that amazing? God just dwelling amongst our groups? Come on, bro. Come on. God just doesn't want to see anything indecent. Yeah. Come on. God doesn't want to see anything impure. And here's what you have to think about. If God turns away, if he sees something indecent from our camp, from our group, then can we have any protection? Um, will there be any victory or success in our lives? No. The enemy can have full reign and authority over us. And that's not what I signed up for. Come on, bro. I didn't sign up for the church to become like the world. Amen? Amen, bro. I signed up. I signed up for the church to be the church of the living God. Come yeah. on, bro. And this isn't rude on God's part. He just doesn't want to be where sin is. He's kind of like perfect. And he doesn't understand <laughs> sin. You guys with me here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now here's what I want to convey. Fear God in this area, but fear not being used by God. A lot of my spiritual growth I just attribute to the purity of heart. Yeah. It has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with God using the God that is clean. That's it. Yeah. My life was very similar to Eric's. There's a lot of things to where if before Christ, before Jesus, you look at my life and go, oh my, my, I don't even want to get near that young man. <laughs> but I made a decision to be a pure vessel for God in June 10th. June 13th, excuse me, 2010. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And what happened was, God did more in my life because I'm being used by God versus using God than I could ever imagine. Beautiful wife. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on. I never got in a million years I'd be married. I'd be preaching the word. I'd be overseeing a group of campus and teens. I'd be sharing about what's on my heart. But guess what? I can't help but to share what's on my heart. Write this scripture down. I'll close with this. 
And that's Psalm 30, verse 10. And the Bible says to share the righteousness of God. See, when you can't help but share what's on your heart, that means what's on your heart is something righteous. It's what's pure. And I believe as a, as a region, as a world, this is all we need. It's a heart that's not choked out. It's a heart that isn't sick. A heart that's not impure. But a heart that wants to be used by God. Yeah. What's yeah. your challenge this morning? Your challenge is to circumcise your heart. Yeah, come on. Come on. Your challenge is to circumcise your heart. And I pray that this can be the most fruitful time we've ever seen as a ministry and the most fruitful you've ever been in your life. And the God be the Come on, Amen. Come on bro.